Hello and welcome to the Valley Today. I am your host, Janet Michael. It is Community Health Day. That is the day every month we meet up with someone from Valley Health to talk about a health topic of some sort. We have talked about such a wide range of things from brain tumors to heart attacks to mental health to physical therapy, all sorts of things. Today, because September is peripheral arterial disease and Thank you, Dr. Sharma, for saying pad. I'm so excited that we're going to be able to say pad (laughs) instead of peripheral arterial disease awareness month. We're going to be talking about that topic today with Dr. Sharma. He is a vascular surgeon. He works with Valley Health's vascular surgeons at Winchester Medical Center. So thank you, Dr. Sharma, for taking some time to chat with me and educate me today. No, thank you very much for having me. I appreciate this opportunity. So let's start with what is PAD? Because when I first saw the notes, as I skimmed them, I'm thinking, oh, we're talking about heart issues again this month, but that's not necessarily the case. Right. So same concept, but different locations. So there's peripheral arterial disease, and then there is coronary artery disease. So coronary artery disease is when you have blockages inside the heart, and then you have peripheral arterial disease, which is basically plaque blockages outside of the heart. And that can be anywhere. So our field really deals with blockages anywhere in the body outside of the heart and the brain. And I would assume typically those are in our limbs, arms, legs, things like that is probably where we would notice them more than in other spots. To be quite honest, they can be anywhere. So we have them in the arteries or we can develop blockages in the arteries in our abdomen. We can develop them in our legs, our arms, and even in our necks, which is a common sort of source for strokes. How common is PAD in the U.S.? Yeah, so the truth is we don't really know. The best estimate that we have is around 30 million or so, so about a tenth of the population. Interestingly enough, when young men were coming back from Vietnam at the age of 19 or so, a lot of them unfortunately came back and had autopsies done on them, and men as young as 18 or 19 had plaque in their arteries. And since then, I'd say our diets have probably only gotten worse and probably some of our health habits have probably gotten worse than what they were in the 70s. Truly, a lot of people probably have this issue, but in the vast majority of people, it's not something that ever becomes a problem in their life. And truthfully, we don't really understand why certain people develop these sort of blockages in these variety of areas as opposed to others. So for example, Europeans, right? Like they have a much higher incidence of smoking, but it's not like they're having these operations done at a lower or higher clip than we do here. So truth is we've found a disease pattern and we've found a way to treat it, but we don't really understand why it happens and why only certain people are the ones that develop these longstanding issues with them. Based on that, are there certain groups of people then that you can target? A lot of times we hear senior citizens or we hear people who smoke or people who eat a lot of fast food, have high fat diets. That, I guess, makes it a little more difficult for you to say these are the kinds of people that should be aware of this type of disease. Right. So where you develop these blockages is very much dependent on your risk profile, right? So people who have problems with high blood pressure will develop these blockages in places like their neck and maybe the arteries in their thigh or even inside their abdomen. People who are diabetics will develop them in the far part of their foot or below the knee. And then really it's the small vessels that get affected. In terms of who are the people we can target, certainly people with high blood pressure, people with poorly controlled diabetes, and people who are smokers. If you're somebody who hits all three of those, you're at a higher risk for developing a blockage that becomes a problem in your life. Are there signs or symptoms that people should be aware of if they do check, sadly, all three of those boxes? Are there things they should be looking out for that maybe right now they're just saying, oh, that's just getting old or that's just something else? The truth is that the signs and symptoms depend on which arteries get affected. So for example, if your artery in the neck called the carotid artery 
is the one that's affected with these blockages, what you will develop are actually stroke-like symptoms. So it's been really nice that in the United States, there's been this whole push for remembering, you know, what the signs of a stroke are, the FAST acronym, right? So the facial drew, facial asymmetry, trouble speaking, and trouble moving your limbs. So basically, if your carotid artery is the one that is affected, in that case, what you will develop are stroke-like symptoms. If it's the blockages in your legs, it's a different sort of problem. What we call that is called critical limb threatening ischemia. Okay. Meaning that chronically over time, your leg is getting less blood flow than what it would ideally like to see. And that develops as usually cramping when walking. And it's specifically with walking. We see a lot of people in our clinics who talk about, oh, I get cramping at night or I get cramping when I'm doing this, that, or the other. It's not that it's only with walking a certain distance. And then again, we don't understand why, but a subset of those people who get cramping with walking will likely progress to developing wounds on their feet or pain at rest. Obviously the end point of that disease process, some percentage of those people will end up with amputations. I, as a layman, assume that goes back to the blockage causing not proper blood flow. So once, if your blood is not flowing to all the places it needs to go, it trickles down into all these other things. Correct. And a lot of people have these blockages, but it's been so slow and over time that their body has rerouted the blood to make little side arteries to compensate. And a lot of people probably don't even realize that they have a problem with this because their bodies has compensated so well. How is it diagnosed? Do primary care physicians know who's in these risk groups because they are their patients? So they're asking them the questions to prompt them to think, hey, does this happen to me? Yeah, certainly the primary care physicians are a big gatekeeper for this, right? They are the first ones that are going to hear about, oh, I had an event where I couldn't move my arm, or I had an event where I was, for the past few months, I've been walking and cramping every hundred feet. So they are usually the ones that are hearing about it first. The first sort of testing that's done to diagnose this is an ultrasound. And so it's totally non-invasive. We get you into the office. One of our techs will basically perform an ultrasound on your arteries, and that'll help us find blockages in your legs if they're causing you any problems. And how difficult is it to treat? Can you recover from it? We have two ways of treating things. One is called the endovascular approach, which means that we're using things like wires, catheters, balloons, and stents. So if you've ever had somebody, or if you know of somebody that's had a heart stent put in, it's that same process, except we're treating the blockages in your leg instead of the ones in your heart or any other part of your body. So that's the endovascular approach. And then before the endovascular approach, what we used to do was basically open surgeries. And again, just like you have a heart bypass surgery, we do leg bypasses and bypasses in the arteries in your abdomen as well. So those are the two sort of ways that we treat the disease process. Over the last, I'd say 10, 20 years, the endovascular approach has really been pushed, but we're finding that even though it's convenient in the sense that it's a small little, little cut in your groin or where, wherever part that's being treated and you get to go home the same day, some people are really better off with having that full old school bypass. Are, and I ask this of everyone because I'm just so beyond fascinated with it. Do you use the robots for the surgery? <laughs> uh, you know, to be honest, as the field has become more conscious about radiation safety, there are some companies that are trying to develop a robotic platform to do these endovascular interventions. It just hasn't taken off. And we haven't really found a good enough robot to sort of like emulate the sort of tactile feedback you get when you're working with these wires and catheters. So I'm sure it's just a matter of time, but not quite yet. Valley Health is going to regret the day they ever told me, A, told me about these <laughs> robots and B, then let me be a part of the program that got to operate ones because there now I need to know all of the things about anything that involves these robots because it is fascinating and it speeds up recovery time. For sure. And on that front, I'd say our speedy recovery time option is that an endovascular approach, the ones with wires and catheters. So yeah, like a lot of patients will get diagnosed in the office and then we'll set up a procedure for them and then they'll go home the same day of the procedure. So it's not quite the robot, but it's there. <laughs> 
let's take a break. When we come back, can we talk about some of the other vascular conditions that you treat there at Valley Health Vascular Surgery Center? Absolutely. That sounds great. We are on the screen today for our Community Health Day. It is sponsored by Valley Health. Dr. Sharma is joining us. He is a vascular surgeon with Valley Health Vascular Surgeons at Winchester Medical Center. September is Peripheral Arterial Disease. PAD is how we've been referring to it. Awareness Month. We're going to talk more about that when we come back in just a couple of minutes. Don't let a cringy DJ ruin your wedding day. Celebrate confidently instead with Summit Events Co., the premier entertainment company in the Shenandoah Valley. Summit Events is serving 200 couples a year with five-star reviewed DJs, photo booths, 360 booths, live music, and more. You can celebrate confidently with Ben Savory, Summit Events founder and chief party officer who was just named the Top of Virginia Entrepreneur of the Year. Don't risk your wedding. Book a professional at summiteventsco.com. That's summiteventsco.com and on Instagram at summiteventsco. Welcome back to the Valley today. I am your host, Janet Michael. It is Community Health Day, sponsored by Valley Health. Today, we are talking with Dr. Sharma. He is a vascular surgeon with Valley Health Vascular Surgeons at Winchester Medical Center. September is Peripheral Arterial Disease Awareness Month. That is PAD. We talked in the first segment a lot about what it is, how common it is, who's at risk, all of the standard things that we normally talk about. But one of the things that you mentioned in that first conversation, Dr. Sharma, was if you have a buildup or a blockage in your carotid artery, sometimes those symptoms look like a stroke. So then I would assume stroke prevention would be a high priority for you and your team, because if you can keep that from happening, sometimes you can keep all the other things from happening. For sure. So basically, we have found that we studied thousands and thousands of people around the United States and we had trials done too across the country that looked at these carotid blockages. And what we basically found was that at certain um, degree of stenosis, meaning like how tight that blockage is and certain morphologies, people, we can help them avoid having a big stroke in the future. Certainly it's an operation that is gratifying from the standpoint that you're preventing something as opposed to truly, you know, treating an active problem right now. But it's also tough because patients are always surprised that they feel the exact same way after the operation. But yes, no, your point is totally well taken. Stroke prevention is a big deal for us. Whether it be somebody who has recently had a stroke or has never had a stroke in the past, we treat them all. That always is my biggest worry because I always feel like they come when you don't expect them. And you do have to be so very quick in getting in treatment, calling 911, getting to a hospital, all of these things. So I, having a stroke is always my, my biggest fear because they do, while I say they seem to come out of nowhere, you know better. <laughs> the carotid artery is actually usually only responsible for about 20% of all strokes that happen, meaning that strokes happen for a variety of other reasons also. But again, like I said, the good thing is that people now have developed more of an awareness of what strokes are and what stroke-like symptoms are. And that makes it easier for us to really get people in and taken care of in a timely manner. Let's talk for a minute, too, about aneurysms, because I think traditionally we think of those as happening only in the brain, but that's not necessarily the case either. So aneurysms can truly happen anywhere in an artery. They can happen in the, basically what's called the aorta. It's this giant candy cane shaped tube that comes out of your heart and it delivers the blood to the rest of your body. So we treat aortic aneurysms quite often, to be quite honest. And that also has slowly migrated over time through a paradigm of the open version where you get a scalpel and you get a big cut on your on your abdomen, basically, and we treat it with our hands, get our hands around the artery and fix it. And now there are stents that you can use to fix those aneurysms as well. So that has also migrated towards a old fashioned and the new fashion way of treating things. There's also aneurysms that you can get in literally the arteries of your legs. So for example, yesterday, me and one of my partners, Dr. Kumar, took care of a gentleman who had a popliteal artery aneurysm. They can also happen in the arteries that feed your gut. So really they can happen anywhere. The good thing about practicing vascular surgery in 2024 is that we can really tailor the operation to the patients, meaning that if we feel that that they would have a good result with the endovascular approach using wires, catheters, and stents, then we'll do that. But if we really feel like the 
best outcome that they can have is with an open operation, we're more than happy to do that as well. And that's where we as patients bear some of the responsibility because we need to be very much aware of how we feel, what our activity levels are. We need to be able to give you as much information as we possibly can so that the best decision can be made. Right. And on some level, just being open to the idea of having your concerns being heard out by a doctor, right? So I come from a family of people who are very good at downplaying their problems. And that's not uncommon and perfectly not uncommon in the, this part of the state. So I think if you feel that something is wrong, I would strongly advocate for go talk to a doctor about it. And even if it means that you waste a few hours, let's just say of your life, then so be it. How are aneurysms different from say blood clots? We hear a lot. I've had family members that have had blood clots in their legs or blood clots in other parts of their body. And people freak out, oh my gosh, if that gets to your lungs or if that gets to something else, is that vascular related or is that a whole different field? No, it's very much sort of part and parcel. So an aneurysm is basically where your artery starts to bulge out a little bit, right? And over time, after a certain amount of size, we've learned that they can actually rupture, okay? And if they don't rupture, they can develop clot inside of them and they can shower that clot all the time. So they, depending on the location of your aneurysm, the problem that they give you is different. Now, blood clots are totally different in the sense that if you have a clot in your vein, what we do is we basically give you some blood thinners and will more than likely monitor your leg. Right. And the blood thinner doesn't actually make the blood clot go away. What the blood thinner does is that it stops your blood clot from getting bigger and your body has natural mechanisms that over time, it'll start to chew down the clot that you've developed. And that's in your veins, right? So veins and arteries are different. So if you get a blood clot in your artery, very different problem. If you get a blood clot in your artery, it can basically lead you to a condition called acute limb ischemia, which means that you're at risk for losing your limb. Okay. And though symptoms of that are very striking, you'll immediately feel pain. You'll immediately feel that something is wrong. Whereas in your veins, it can feel like, oh yeah, for the last couple of days to weeks, I've been having some swelling or, oh, I just got off of a plane flight. That was like 12 hours or something. It's classic stuff. So yeah, so they're very different processes and very different therapies. We really do tend, you make a good point because all of us, I think in some way do tend to find other excuses and right. other reasons like, oh, it's just because I'm getting old and that's why my arm hurts sometimes right. or I shouldn't have all of these things to keep us from actually going to a doctor who could diagnose and prevent something much worse from happening. Totally. So what would you say to someone who's listening right now that maybe has experienced any of those or potentially has a history in their family of yeah. someone who has had had? Do you yeah. suggest they go talk to their primary care physician? What should they be doing right now? Yeah, I think if you are somebody who might even think that you might have a problem with peripheral arterial disease, see your primary care doctors. They are extremely well-trained to suss out what potential causes of certain complaints might be. And if you find that you've got peripheral arterial disease, feel free to ask your primary care doctor to be referred to a vascular surgeon once you have the diagnosis, or even before you have the diagnosis, to be quite honest. And we're happy to take care of you. And to be quite honest, what I tell patients is that once you have a diagnosis, of peripheral ar arterial disease, and especially once we operate on you, we're basically friends for life, right? <laughs> so we, we surveil our patients heavily. There are guidelines for this too. So every three to six months, I'm seeing certain patients. And that's the joy of the field, to be quite honest, is that you get to develop that, that long-term friendship with the patients. So I would really say, yeah, if you feel like something's going on in your life and you are bothered by it, go see your primary care doctor. And if you end up having peripheral arterial disease, then our doors are wide open. Now you have a new friend. Thank you, Dr. Sharma, for taking some time today to educate me on peripheral arterial disease. I feel like I know a lot. Now I'm going to go out and pretend to be a doctor for the next six months and start diagnosing and telling people what they should be doing. <laughs> and then I've done my job, clearly. <laughs> But I appreciate you taking the time today. Thank you. And anytime. I will be back tomorrow with a brand new episode of The Valley today. We are chatting with Joanne Royalty. She's talking about the seed lending libraries 
from the Northern Shenandoah Valley Master Gardeners. You can find them at any of our local actual libraries. We're going to get details for that tomorrow, just a few minutes after noon.